Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm Joe Nye, the Dean of the Kennedy School, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you, new and returning students and friends of the school, faculty and staff, to the first of our forums this year. I want to welcome the members of the distinguished delegation that have accompanied President Musharraf here. And uh, finally, it's my privilege to welcome General Pervez Musharraf, President and Chief Executive of Pakistan to the Kennedy School and to Harvard University. We're pleased to have a number of Pakistani students uh, in both our executive and degree programs here with us. Several of them are in the audience tonight. And as a school of public policy and management, we are pleased to say that we have had the pleasure of educating many Pakistani students over the years, and we are working on a new framework with the Pakistan government and the World Bank to explore new ways to develop an executive education program to train civil service officials and, and professional training and education in Pakistan. In this instance, it's my pleasure to welcome Harvard's 27th president, Lawrence Summers, to introduce General Musharraf. Larry has been back at Harvard as president for just over a year now, an award-winning economist. Uh, he has been active in public service throughout his career, uh, most recently as Secretary of the Treasury of the United States. Without further delay, please join me in welcoming President Lawrence Summers. Thanks very much, uh, Joe, and uh, welcome everyone to the first uh, program in this forum uh, for this academic uh, year. One of the things I was very struck by in coming back to uh, Harvard was the vitality of the Kennedy School and the remarkable ability of this forum to attract leaders from all over the world some 20 heads of state and former heads of state and the Secretary of the General of the United Nations uh, visited us uh, last year. I anticipate, uh, led by our speaker this evening, another remarkable year uh, this year, that we are able to attract such people is a tribute to the entire Kennedy School community of faculty, students, and uh, alumni uh, leaders. It is a real pleasure to welcome the President of Pakistan, Pervez Musharraf, along with uh, the President's delegation, which includes the Foreign Minister, Information Minister, and Finance Minister of Pakistan. Pakistani cooperation with Harvard goes back a very long way. I can't speak authoritatively uh, to what it has meant uh, for Pakistan, but I know it has meant a great deal uh, to uh, the university. We have worked together for almost uh, 50 years since the early days of Pakistan's existence as a nation. In 1954, Ed, Mace Ed Mason, then the dean of what is today known as the Kennedy School of Government, led a team of scholars to Pakistan to help draw up a development plan. That effort began with a team of just eight scholars, grew first into Harvard's Development Advisory Service, and then through a number of incarnations into what is today our Center for International Development. That collaboration also led to what we today refer to as the Mason Fellows Program, perhaps the Kennedy School's premier international master's degree uh, program. Today, the Kennedy School and the university as a whole are strengthened by many students from Pakistan and indeed from, th from throughout uh, South Asia. I am told that the performance uh, put on uh, each year is a truly incredible showcase for South Asian culture as well as for the artistic talents of our students. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, 
tonight's guest. President Musharraf was born in Delhi in 1943, living there until his family moved to Pakistan after the 1947 partition with India. His father joined the Foreign Service shortly thereafter and was posted to Turkey for a number of years. And it was there that President Musharraf learned to speak Turkish. Upon his family's return to Pakistan, the young Pervez Musharraf attended some of the top schools in Karachi. In 1961, he began what was to become a long and distinguished career in Pakistan's military by enrolling in the Pakistan Military Academy. He has since served in numerous staff and command roles, including seven years as a member of Pakistan's elite special service groups, before eventually becoming chief of the Army staff. Pervez Musharraf began ex exercising his duties as chief executive of Pakistan in October 1999 and was sworn in as president on October 7th. 2001. I think it is safe to say that Pakistan, throughout its long history, has played an important role on the world stage. But since the horrific events of a year ago, it has been thrust into the spotlight as never before. Now more than ever, the world is watching with intense interest what happens in Pakistan and is listening very carefully to the words of its leader. For that reason, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our first ARCO Forum guest for this academic year, the President of Pakistan, Pervez Musharraf. Raman Rahib, President Dr. Larry Summers, Dean Nye, distinguished members of the faculty, alumni, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum, as they say in Pakistan. It is a pleasure to be here in Cambridge again after my visit last February, and indeed a privilege to be hosted by the Harvard University and to be addressing its alumni. I am indeed th thankful to you, President Summers, for your gracious invitation to me. I would also like to thank Dean Nye and the Kennedy School for organizing this evening's program. Harvard, as we all know, is synonymous with the spirit of inquiry learning, and academic excellence. Harvard's contribution to expanding the frontiers of human knowledge is universally recognized. It has produced seven United States presidents, I'm told, and some 40 Nobel laureates, of whom two are from the family of President Summers. <laughs> it is therefore a unique privilege to be addressing this August gathering. And may I add, Pakistan has benefited a lot from the Harvard University. The students from this institution have certainly contributed to the development of Pakistan in a great manner. And we always, we in Pakistan, know of the potential and the standing and the quality of Harvard University. We all know that. Ladies and gentlemen, Today, I would like to share with you my vision of Pakistan in the 21st century. We in Pakistan are striving to build a nation which is modern, moderate, tolerant, and a progressive, democratic, Islamic state. Regionally and internationally, we wish to be a force for peace and stability. 
and a reliable partner of the world community. On the civilizational plane, we see Pakistan as an important bridge between the Islamic world and the West. The inspiration for our vision comes from our founding father, Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. He was a true Renaissance man, passionately attached to the quest for modernity. He desired his new country to be progressive and moderate internally and a promoter of amity among nations externally. He wanted his Pakistan to be at peace within and at peace without. This was the guiding light when we began our journey as an independent nation in August 1947. It was a remarkably hopeful moment. We made quick strides in many spheres and created an impact internationally. But in the decades of the 70s, 80s, and the 90s, we lost our way. Successive leaders failed to address mounting economic, political, and social challenges. National institutions were destroyed. Merit gave way to favoritism and nepotism. The economy was eroded almost to the point of default. Human rights were throttled and democracy was equated merely with elections and abused flagrantly for personal profit. The people of Pakistan became utterly demoralized and disenchanted. When I came to office three years ago, I had one overriding objective, to stem the drift and change the course, to construct a future of hope for the people of Pakistan. We accepted the challenge and initiated a far-reaching process of national reconstruction, reform, and restructuring. At its core, this reform process has four areas of focus. It seeks economic revival, which is at the base of all other progress in any sphere of activity. It seeks good governance, political restructuring to ensure stable and enduring democracy, and human resource development focused especially on poverty alleviation. On the top of the priority list has been the revival of the economy of Pakistan. I'm not going to go into the details of this, what we've achieved, but I would just like to say that, the, that Pakistan's macroeconomic indicators reveal the positive and very encouraging results that we have achieved. I will just quote a few. That our foreign exchange reserves now stand at a record high. Our foreign and domestic debts, which were soaring all along, have been reduced for the first time in the history of Pakistan. Our fiscal deficit, has also been substantially reduced from 7% to 4.9%. Again, this is because of the reduction in our expenses and the control on our expenditures that we have executed. Our inflation is well in check, keeping it at around 3%. Our exports have reached a historical record. The exchange rate of the Pakistan rupee is extremely stable. So these are, these are the macroeconomic indicators showing a positive future. However, having said that, I will add that challenges remain. The principal economic challenges that face Pakistan are further reduction in our debt, attraction of foreign investment, and poverty alleviation. On the whole, however, Pakistan's economy now, I am convinced, stands poised for sustainable growth. In the social sector, we are pursuing a holistic approach, an overall strategy focusing specially on education, health, gender balance, and poverty alleviation has been formulated and is under execution. 
In the education sector, we are concentrating on literacy level, bringing qualitative improvement and the improvement of madrasa education. Since this is an educational institution, I would just like to spend another minute on it. We have taken a holistic approach, as I said. We have evolved strategies in four tiers of education. Firstly, we want to improve our literacy level through universalization of education and through adult literacy. This is one area of focus. The other area of focus, we are concentrating on primary and secondary education and bringing qualitative improvement in this through improving the quality of teachers, improving our curriculum, and improving the examination system. Thirdly, we have looked into the higher education of Pakistan, the university level education, and we are modifying the University Act, and we have evolved a strategy of improving higher education through creating a higher education commission. And may I say that in this strategy, we invited eminent educationists and people who understood education from all over the world, in fact, Pakistanis from all over the world. And one of the contributors to this uh, steering committee that I created was a person from Boston, in fact, Dr. Tariq Banuri, who is from Boston. He has helped create this uh, higher education commission and the recommendations of it. And the fourth area of concentration in the education is the madrasa education, the religious school education. And we have introduced a new strategy to improve that education and bring them closer to the education, mainstream education of Pakistan. So this is the overall education strategy that is under implementation. In the health sector, we want to improve the primary le level of health care where the masses really live. Having said this much of the social sector, let me say that we face a resource constraint in pursuing this strategy that we have evolved. We seek increased investment. We also seek a strategy of debt reduction and also debt education swap and debt development swap from all those who have given money to us, who have helped us in our finances, from all our donors. My government undertook the process, process of political restructuring from the outset. We started the process at the grassroots level, introducing popularly elected local governments at the district and subdivision level, tehsil we call them, and the union levels. Through this system, we have genuinely empowered the impoverished. Political, administrative, and financial authority has been devolved to the people of Pakistan at the grassroots level. They have, been they have been made masters of their own destiny. This is the essential infrastructure of democracy at the grassroots, starting from the grassroots level. Community-based programs of economic development and political participation are central in all our endeavors. The devolution plan and strengthening of municipal bodies has generated a silent revolution at the grassroots level, which is bringing a visible change in the lives of the people in their towns and villages throughout Pakistan. And this word silent revolution was actually used by one of the international finance institutions. Our objective of building a human rights culture flows from this very philosophy. Special emphasis has been placed on police and jail reforms, protection and promotion of the rights of minorities, and the empowerment of women. An unprecedented 33% of the seats in the local government have been reserved for women, other than their being allowed to fight in the normal open seats with, against men. This is the most powerful tool for gender empowerment. We have always envisaged Pakistan's future to be fully democratic. Our democratic transition is well underway. It will reach culmination with the nation, national elections in October. We are convinced that sustainable democracy can only thrive if, at, if it has deep roots and appropriate checks and balances. We have therefore instituted necessary constitutional changes. 
These changes flow essentially from our dismal political experience. They seek to rectify the weaknesses in the system. The system has, is homegrown to the dictates and the requirements of the Pakistani environment. They are designed to ensure checks and balances on all power brokers in the country. And when I say power brokers, there are three power brokers in Pakistan. One is the president, the other is the prime minister, and the third is the army chief. And the, continue, the second issue is the continuity of the reform agenda. And thirdly, is the prevention of breakdowns in democracy, which Pakistan has experienced in its 50 years of history. This is what we want to achieve. So all our reforms and restructuring, political restructuring, is aimed at having sustainable democracy introduced in Pakistan. I know it's rather odd for an army man or a military man to be talking of democracy, but that is how uh, it is. I am at the helm of affairs, and I am extremely democratic. You have to believe me when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what we are trying is to introduce real democracy into Pakistan, a real sustainable democracy into Pakistan, because unfortunately that was not what the politicians could manage, unfortunately. Now to improve the law and order situation and bring internal harmony, we have promoted a dialogue with religious scholars to ensure that militancy and religious extremism have no place in our society. Shunning the illiterate view of Islam and promoting the progressive concept of true Islam shall remain our endeavor. Madrasa reforms to protect them against exploitation and misguidance will continue to be implemented with resolve. I, am, I remain determined not to allow a fringe element to hold the entire nation hostage and hijack our agenda of reforms. I am convinced that success in these endeavors will fundamentally reorient Pakistan in keeping with our vision and in response to the aspirations of the people of Pakistan. I remain personally committed to the continuity and sustainability of this reform process. Now, ladies and gentlemen, talking of our regional and international role. In the 21st century, we envision Pakistan as a strong force for regional peace and stability, engaged with its neighbors in a partnership for prosperity and a reliable interlocutor of the world community on global issues. Our strategic geographic location at the crossroads of the Middle East, Central Asia, and South Asia places us in an eminent position of responsibility. Our foreign policy is being crafted to meet the challenges and opportunities arising from this vision. Pakistan is and will remain a key member of the global coalition against international terrorism. The strategic decisions we took after September 11 are consistent with our moral principles and national interest. Our unstinting support has been critical in the battle against terrorism. This support would continue until our shared objectives are fully met. Some detractors in the media who talk of my backing down from commit commitments and statements are being less than objective. They need to have a clear, clearer picture of ground realities. Over the past two decades, ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan has hosted the world's last, largest refugee population. Over three and a half million refugees from Afghanistan. For the most part, we have shouldered this heavy burden with our own limited resources. Assistance from international humanit humanitarian organizations, we calculated over all these years, amounted to under $15 per head per year. We have done so in recognition of our international obligations and with a sense of compassion. We will continue to work with the UNHCR and the donor countries. The only solution 
of the Afghan refugee problem is the return of the refugees to a secure and peaceful Afghanistan. Therefore, political harmony, socio-economic development, and reconstruction of Afghanistan are critical objectives for our entire region. Pakistan has a legitimate interest in having a friendly Afghanistan on our western borders. We wholeheartedly support the Bonn Agreement and the Karzai government. The deployment of the International Security Assistance Force, the ISAF, and the continued commitment of the United States to bringing normalcy into Afghanistan would further advance the objectives of reconstruction and internal security which are necessary for the resolution of a peaceful and prosperous Afghanistan. Pakistan will continue to make its due contribution to Afghanistan's re-emergence as a stable and economically viable state. Ladies and gentlemen, an enlightened sense of national interest guides our policy of seeking peaceful relations with India. However, our initiate initiatives continue, continue to meet with Indian intransigence. Since September 11, we have faced a relentless Indian campaign to cast Pakistan and the Kashmiris on the wrong side of the terrorism issue. The fact is that Kashmir is a 54-year-old dispute it is the unfinished business of the creation of independent Pakistan and India in 1947. Terrorism, terrorism itself did not create the tragedy of Kashmir. On the contrary, denial or delay in the resolution of the dispute has led to desperation and militancy. To pretend that there is no political problem in Kashmir and that Pakistan is to blame for all the troubles, is to endorse injustice and repression against a people who have been denied their genuine and inter internationally recognized right of self-determination for over half a century now. The solution lies in giving them their inalienable right to determine their own future in accordance with the resolutions of the United Nations Security Council. The Indo-Pakistan relations today are at their lowest ebb. Their forces confront each other, eyeball to eyeball, with most dangerous possibilities of the eruption of conflict by accident. India projects the indigenous freedom struggle of the Kashmiri people as cross-border terrorism. Pakistan has condemned terrorism but in all its forms and manifestations, anywhere around the world. But we believe that state terrorism must also be condemned. Attempts to misrepresent Pakistan's position otherwise are sinister and may be motivated. Pakistan has made major commitments and taken significant steps to ease the current crisis. India must take reciprocal steps in order to impart permanence and sustainability to the initiatives for peace that we have taken. We await de-escalation and resum resumption of dialogue to resolve our disputes with India, especially the Kashmir dispute. President Bush, Secretary Powell, and senior administration, administration officials have been engaged in efforts for the reduction of tensions in South Asia. There is grave risk and nothing to be gained. From military brinkmanship, issues must be resolved peacefully through political and diplomatic means. From our perspective, India needs to be persuaded that coercion is not a viable instrument of policy in our regional environment. And as it is, Pakistan cannot be coerced. It is also important not to be misled by any electoral exercise that India is trying to stage in Kashmir. The so-called elections in Kashmir have had a long history of manipulation by New Delhi. 
There is no possibility that these can be free, fair, open, transparent and inclusive. The very fact that international observers are being denied any oversight role proves this point beyond any doubt. It is for the Kashmiris to decide of their own free will whether they want to participate in elections or not. But the possibility, indeed the likelihood, that they will be forced to vote must be prevented. Elections within the Indian constitution negate the United Nations Security Council resolution itself. These so-called elections, in any case, are no substitute for the plebiscite promised to the people of Kashmir by the United Nations Security Council and the international community. Kashmir remains a disputed territory. Pakistan remains ready to discuss all issues. We are, however, convinced that without meaningful progress towards the resolution of the Kashmir issue in conformity with the wishes of the Kashmiri people, relations between Pakistan and India cannot be normalized. The United States, with friendly ties with both Pakistan and India, is in a unique position to facilitate the resolution of this core dispute between us. And this will create the conditions necessary to establish durable peace in South Asia. Peace and security in South Asia are vital to the economic development and prosperity in the region. Peace in the region will also contribute significantly to the promotion of international peace and stability given South Asia's strategic location astride regions with vast natural resources and economic potential. Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to touch upon an issue of great significance for the Muslims and people everywhere. While world leaders have rightly asserted that the effort to eliminate terrorism is not directed against any religion or a people, there is concern among the Islamic nations over the emergence of widespread prejudice, in some cases even xenophobia. Some have succumbed to the temptation of simplistic explanations for the phenomenon of terrorism and have sought to sow seeds of conflict at a time when greater understanding among cultures and civilization is needed. Hate should have no market. It must be stamped out with the same zeal with which the fight against terrorism is being pursued. Pakistan is a frontline member of the International Coalition Against Terrorism and is making a crucial contribution to the war against terrorism. Islam, as its very name signifies, is a religion of peace and tolerance. It neither supports nor condones terrorism. Pakistan is an important part of the Islamic community which is composed of over 50 nations and one-fifth of humanity, and which has condemned and rejected terrorism. It is important, ladies and gentlemen, that we are not misled by emotive sloganeering. We must diagnose the malaise and treat the root causes of terrorism. What is it that conjures up such storms in the mind of individuals? What motivates a suicide bomber that his instinct for survival is overcome by a death wish. Is there any redress available to a people who fear repression and perpetuation of injustice in response to their legitimate demands for freedom and dignity? These questions and others have to be faced and addressed. Occupation, repression, injustice, denial of human rights, and economic deprivation must be eliminated through cooperative efforts. We must create a new international order based on a universally shared vision of justice, fair play, and mutual respect in which we are all partners and participants. I am an advocate of civilizational dialogue as an important pillar of our strategy. Stereotypes on both sides have caused too much damage. 
it is time we began dealing with the real Islam and the real West rather than caricatures of each. The dialogue which Pakistan envisions would be promoted through greater exchanges at all levels, quality academic research by exchange scholars to remove misconceptions, enhanced people-to-people -people contacts and vigorous public diplomacy programs to win the hearts and minds of the ordinary people. The United States and Pakistan are well positioned to strengthen their partnership and make a seminal contribution to this effort. On our part, Pakistan's strong but moderate Islamic credentials permit us to speak with credibility and to act as a bridge to create more contacts and greater understanding. We must ensure the Islamic world and the West are allies in combating terrorism and do not at any stage turn into antagonists confronting each other. We have a heavy responsibility to our future generations. The seeds that we sow today will shape events of the future. We have to create a better world for our children, a world of peace, a world of amity and harmony, and not one of conflict and disaster. Let us cast away all prejudices and follow a path of reconciliation. Let us jointly sweep aside all forces of intolerance and radicalism in whichever society they exist. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, let me say that the international community understands what Pakistan is doing and how significant our role is for our region and the world. The people of Pakistan have supported me at every step of the way. I have no doubt that we shall achieve our vision and rebuild Pakistan according to the ideals and values envisioned by our founder and which we hold so close to our hearts. I thank you all for your patience. We now have time for questions and answers. You will find there are two mics on the floor and two in the balconies. Uh, let me remind you that questions are short, to the point, end with a question mark, and they come one per customer. There is only one speaker tonight, and you've already heard him. If anybody goes on with too long a preamble to their question, I'll ask them to please sit down and turn it over to the next person. Uh, I won't apply that, however, to the first questioner, who will be the president of Harvard University. I had counted myself as, du I had counted myself as duly chastised and warned, uh, Dean Nye. Mr. President, thank you very much for that uh, comprehensive presentation of uh, your priorities uh, for Pakistan. I wonder if you could expand a bit on one subject uh, you touched on, and that is uh, the gender question. Our colleague at Harvard, Amartya Sen, some time ago published an article that got enormous attention, focusing on the ratios of women to men in the population of uh, different countries as an indicator of how women were treated. Uh, according to his figures, Pakistan had uh, the lowest ratio of women uh, to men in the world, some 90 women for every 100 men, in contrast to a global average that was very considerably greater and on the other side of 100. And this was pointed to as evidence of a quite profound uh, cultural and governmental uh, problem uh, for Pakistan, and it is one that you have obviously embraced as a major part of your agenda. And I wonder if you could uh, just say a little bit about where you see the causes of that uh, problem and what approaches your government is pursuing 
uh, to address the treatment of women in Pakistan. Thank you very much. So first of all, the, the ratios that you spoke of, I thought it's uh, not that. It's about, uh, I think, 52%, 51% men and about 49% women. Anyway, I'm not going to dispute the, the figures. Uh, but yes, the majority is men and lesser women, proportionally. Now, uh, the basic factor, as any developing country, uh, I would say uh, that what is happening in Pakistan is exactly what is happening maybe to any, in any de other developing country. Uh, the first way of tackling this is through empowering the women. And I, as I said, we are empowering the women through politics. In, uh, in the, at the local government level, we have given 33% reserved seats to the women of Pakistan. And at the national and provincial level, there are about 18%, 17, 18% reserved seats for the women. This is about 60 women seats reserved. And other than that, they can also contest in the open election. And I expect that at, in the National Assembly, they will be out of 352 seats, there will be roughly about 80 women in the assembly. Now this is unprecedented in Pakistan. Having one third representation at the district level is unprecedented in, uh, in anywhere in the world. So therefore, this is the start point of emancipation of the women. Then in, at all government levels, as far as we are concerned, if, including the judiciary, we are trying to give representation, if not equal, we are trying to give maximum possible representation to the women of Pakistan. So this is what we are trying to do. Other than that, a number of actions that we have taken in the jail reform that we have introduced, special different treatment to the women, a specialized treatment to them. So we have taken a lot of measures which would emancipate the lot of the women. Uh, other than that, the, the, the customs and traditions at the local, in the village level, in the rural areas have to be met through the legal processes which are on ground and any incidents uh, which show uh, negative uh, attitudes towards women have to be tackled really in changing the social environment in Pakistan will, which will come about through more education, through poverty alleviation and through better education which we are trying to do. And in the education sector, may, may I also add, we are giving much more focus to the women's education uh, more than the men's education at the moment. Let me ask uh, speakers to identify themselves. John. Thank you. Uh, my name is Josh Weiner. I'm a senior at the college. Um, you spoke about your role in the coalition the International Coalition, your commitment to fighting terrorism. But I have some concerns that your, your actions haven't always matched your rhetoric. For, for example, when uh, the United States presented evidence that, about Osama bin Laden's role in the uh, September 11th attacks, you recently expressed some doubts that, he, that Osama bin Laden was behind the attacks. And whether or not this last part was your fault, it is in Pakistan that some of Al Qaeda is being harbored right now. The United States is now possibly facing uh, terrorist attacks from Iraq. I'm, I don't know all the evidence. I'm not in the government. But it seems that they are now developing weapons of mass destruction against us. So my question to you is, if we were to give you evidence showing that Saddam Hussein was planning weapons of mass destruction to hurt America, would you accept this evidence as the truth? And more importantly, would you then support an American attack on Iraq to stop that attack on us? The attack on uh, we, nobody has ever discussed uh, stopping of attack, Iraqi attack on America, really. We are discussing uh, internationally the attack of United States attack on Iraq, really. Uh, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but you've given a new angle to it of uh, whether I would... Uh, whether I would support uh, United States if there was an Iraqi attack on United States. Yes, if there was any country attacking any other country with a nuclear device, certainly I would like to go on the side of the victim uh, and not certainly of the attacker, because this is concerned. Uh, but as far as uh, uh, the issue of Iraq otherwise is concerned, uh, Pakistan has its hands full with so many problems on our eastern border. <laughs> on our western border, 
domestically or internal uh, sectarian extremism, we don't want to uh, get involved in uh, any other troubles or issues around the world. <laughs> On the left balcony. My name is Orijit Gupta. I'm a student from India at the business school. I had a quick question. Uh, you mentioned that you would uh, support any country that was attacked with a nuclear weapon, uh, but you yourself have threatened India with nuclear attack. You have attacked Car uh, in Kargil when India tried to have peace talks with Nawaz Sharif, apparently without Nawaz Sharif finding out about it. I don't know how that happened. And recently there was an attack in Parliament, in the Indian Parliament. Uh, in spite of all these things, why do you think the Indian leaders would have the political ability to talk to you? Isn't that's yeah. fun with the question. I don't know uh, whether the situation was different before July when I went to Agra. Uh, the, all that you've said happened before that, isn't it? When I could be invited to Agra and we were discussing peace deals and we were talking of Kashmir, what has changed after the, in, the, in these last six or eight months? I really don't know. But however, coming to your question, now, uh, first of all, uh, that uh, we threatened to have a nuclear attack on India. I, I, I have never uh, said that. I've never spoken about any nuclear attacks. In fact, I have proposed to India denuclearization of South Asia, a no-war pact with India, reduction of forces with India. Which one do you prefer? We can go ahead with that. Okay. Now, you talk about your, the second part of your question is we talked about Kargil. What about Siachen? In, let me tell you that Kargil has a history. Kargil is, is Kashmir. And a Kashmir, Kashmir has 50 years of history. And if you trace back this history, a lot has happened. We have fought three wars, so, and we have had this Siachen adventure by India. So therefore, this whole context, everything that happens in Kashmir, whether it is Kargil or Siachen or anything, has to be seen in its overall context. And let me tell you that in Kargil, it was the Mujahideen who acted. Pakistan did not cross the line of control. And whatever acted was Whatever happened was done by the Mujahideens in Kargil. So what I would like to conclude with is that whatever has happened in the past, we need peace. And I would like to ask you whether peace is possible without solving the Kashmir dispute. All that I'm saying is let us realistically look at events. Let us see facts. We have fought three wars. We are killing each other every day across the line of control in Kashmir. We are doing it mutually, both of us, India and Pakistan. We are also firing. We are not keeping quiet also. So now what we have to see is, do we want peace in the region or we don't want peace? Do we want peace with sovereign equality? I have been saying everywhere, we want peace, but we also, India is a large country, Everyone knows. But Pakistan also has its honor and dignity to guard. And we'll guard it very jealously. And therefore, if we want peace, we will have peace with sovereign equality. And peace can only come about through resolution of the Kashmir dispute. There is no other possibility. So we need to address the Kashmir dispute very frontally. And don't, not to live in the past, in the history of what happened at various <coughs> occasions. If you talk of Kargil, I'll take you back to 1971. I'll take you back to 1984. There's no point in going back in history. Let's look forward if we want peace in the region. Right, Daphne. Hello, President Musharraf. My name is Josh Laxina, and I'm a senior at Harvard College. My question to you is, how do you feel the development of weapons of mass destruction will affect the stability of your region in the coming years? Uh, the weapons of mass destruction uh, were introduced in the region, yes. They were introduced, uh, first of all, when India exploded, exploded its first nuclear device in 1974, and then again in 1997, uh, and we responded, we responded in kind. So this race for uh, nuclear and missile race started in the subcontinent. But as far as Pakistan is concerned, we are quite clear that our nuclear and missile assets are for defensive purposes. And I personally feel that they bring an element of mutual deterrence into the region. However, having said that, 
as I said to the, at the previous question, we are for a reduction in the, uh, for denuclearization of South Asia and reduction of, uh, of forces. So yes, they have, they do have a, a destabilization effect as far as the nuclear element is concerned, but with responsibility on both sides, on the side of India and Pakistan, I am reasonably sure that they also introduce a degree of deterrence and stability, uh, prevention of war, prevention of conflict is also served by the same uh, nuclear and missile assets that both sides uh, uh, own. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Professor Mahmoud Awan, and my question, Mr. President, sir, is regarding your comment about Army Chief being a power broker, correctly as you stated. What do you see as the future uh, in Pakistan with respect to Pakistan Army's role in the political affairs? And having been the Army Chief for several years now, when do you see another Army Chief emerging in the near future? <laughs> Whenever I step down, <laughs> uh, that won't be very far away. Uh, there is, uh, I don't see any role for the military in the running of the government in Pakistan. We don't see the military having any role in the executive and legislative functioning of Pakistan. We don't see army's role at all whatsoever in the governance of Pakistan. The governance of Pakistan, the executive and legislative authority in Pakistan will rest with the prime minister of Pakistan. There is no doubt in that. But having said that, as I said, there is a requirement of checks and balances everywhere. And this is based on the history, the political history of Pakistan. If you see the political history of Pakistan, we know that there have been prime ministers who have concentrated power, usurped power within themselves. They have usurped power and dismissed a president, dismissed a chief justice, dismissed a chief of army staff. This I'm talking of the last prime minister. We've seen a president who has been impulsively on and on whims eliminated a prime minister. We have also seen army chiefs who have been aggressive enough to have taken over and imposed martial law in Pakistan. Now, we need to bring checks and balances on all three of them. How do you, how do you bring this check and balance? Another fact that you need to realize is, whenever Pakistan is in trouble, whenever there is misgovernance, whenever there is loot and plunder, whenever a government is not functioning, the one place that everyone approaches and runs to is the general headquarters and to the army chief. Now, this is the reality in Pakistan. And when you ask me when I have been in the, when I was the army chief and not the chief executive, people were coming to me and asking me, what am I doing? And where the country is going? Why don't you act? This is what people were telling me. Now, what is the response that one has as the army chief? I ask you. The response is go to the prime minister and tell him you need to perform better because there's no institutional arrangement uh, to, to ensure that the prime minister governs better. And if he doesn't listen, what does the army chief have? He has two options, back down and feel humiliated or take over. Is there a third choice? <laughs> now, therefore, we need to take this, we need to see our reality. Don't see Pakistan from British views or American eyes or European eyes or Australian eyes. See Pakistan from Pakistani eyes. What is happening in Pakistan? What has happened in Pakistan? What does our democratic or political culture or shows in the past? So therefore, I would say in the Pakistani environment, we need to have checks and balances on each one of these. And this will come through the National Security Council, which will be an institutionalized forum to exercise checks on any impulsive or misgovernance being done anywhere. I feel it is a necessity, homegrown necessity for Pakistan. Hello, uh, my name is Prasad Bambre, and I'm with the mid-career program here at the Kennedy School. I think you just made a very uh, good case for a very seductive idea, that is to have a benign head of state versus a corrupt but democratic one like uh, your country has seen in the last uh, 11 years or so. In this context, you made a statement which has uh, really got 
a lot of uh, coverage here in the American media, and it makes great sound bites. And I'm going to quote, to keep the army out, you need to keep the army in. You need to bring the army in. I honestly do not understand what that means. Would you care to explain? I explained just now exactly. <laughs> I, when I answered this last question, I really explained that. Okay. If you keep them out, I'll repeat. If you keep them out, what will happen is people, I said people run to the army chief to redress whatever is happening in the country. And this has been happening all along in the history of Pakistan. I know that. So therefore, give a forum, give an institution to the army chief to go to and address the situation. Now, if this National Security Council is there, this forum is available where the army chief goes and handles the situation. And in this forum, there are nine, eight elected members. There are four chief ministers. There's the leader of opposition. The prime minister himself is there, Senate chairman and the National Assembly speaker. All of them are members. They are all elected people. This will be the forum where balance will be brought about and national issues wherever nation is getting destabilized will be addressed. And this is where the army chief will approach. And when you get him into this forum, you have avoided his, the likelihood of an aggressive or an impulsive chief declaring martial law in the country. He will never be able to do that. In that scheme, you do not Sorry, see. One for Cusper. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good you. afternoon. My name is Jack Guerrero. I'm a first year MBA student at the Harvard Business School. I admire your commitment to democracy as very clearly articulated in this presentation. But I must ask, uh, how much validity can you honestly ascribe the recent citizen referendum regarding the legitimacy of your government, where, uh, which resulted in such questionably and extraordinarily high affirmative response at some 99%? I live in a democracy myself here in the United States, and even the most politically popular campaigns hardly result in this level of support. I appreciate your response. Yes. Thank you very much for asking me this question, because this question has been asked to me from me in every forum in Pakistan also. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to give you an answer. Uh, first of all, one has to see uh, why I went in for the referendum. And there was an important aspect. There was a lot happening. We were going in for, it was uh, we, uh, in this year, in the beginning of this year, uh, elections in October were nearing. My three years term was nearing. And therefore, one saw the reality on ground, and one saw that what is required is that I should not be held hostage by the political or politics of Pakistan, that I should draw my strength from the people of Pakistan. And I knew my popularity with the people of Pakistan. It's published in all articles, in all newspapers, in all magazines, that my popularity was something like 75, 80 percent, actually in the nation, in all polls that were coming about. I knew this popularity. So I went to the people of Pakistan to give me an endorsement of whether they want me to be the president of Pakistan. That was the effect that I wanted to create. Let me get the strength from the people of Pakistan. Now, now what happened, uh, yes, it is condemnable. What happened was not what the government dictate was. What happened was at the tactical level, some over-exuberant supporters who may have manipulated or did anything they, which they thought they are doing in my favor, whereas there was no dictate to them, there was no, no need of it, because I knew my popularity. But let me also tell you that there were incidents in this very, on this very issue where people were quoted as saying that we've taken our revenge. In other words, there were negative forces who wanted me to be discredited. So therefore, while the effects that I wanted to create were very positive, what resulted and the, the, uh, the, uh, all the uh, uh, accusations that came about in search, some quarters resulted in negating the effects that I wanted to create. But let me assure you that this was not government policy as such at all. This was not at all government policy because it was not required at all to be done. Right, Melfi. 
Hi, my name is Jim Walsh, and I'm director of a research program here called Managing the Atom. And my question is about the safety of nuclear materials. Pakistan recently announced that it's going to expand its civilian nuclear infrastructure, nuclear energy and the like. And when questioned about its control of nuclear materials, civilian or military, Pakistani officials have uh, assured us that there's absolutely no problem. There have never been any problems. Uh, and it's a great system. Now, by contrast, the US and Russia, which are far richer and have far more technical resources and have a lot more experience, report numerous problems. The US says that it's at, there are over 1,000 radiological sources that have been lost or stolen, and the problems in Russia are legion. So I guess the question is, what does Pakistan know about the protection of nuclear materials that the rich countries don't? Why are they able to do such an incredibly great job, uh, near 100% control, when the other countries have performed so poorly? What lessons should we, the Americans, draw from that? Well, I wouldn't be able to give you any technical answers of what, how, what we are doing, but uh, we have uh, created a fail-safe organization. Uh, we have created a national command authority which oversees all the developments in the nuclear field, nuclear and missile fields. We have undertaken arrangements and uh, which will ensure non-proliferation. -prolifer uh, that is all that I can say. Now, I wouldn't be able to compare what uh, United States and Russia were doing and what difficulties they were facing, but there are no difficulties that we, were, we are facing, really. Uh, I don't know whether we are technologically more advanced than United States, <laughs> but uh, uh, we are not facing any such problem. All that I would like to guarantee to this August gathering is that we will guarantee no proliferation, no pilferage of any nuclear material from Pakistan. Thank you. Good evening, sir. My name is Lala, and I'm a first year at the Kennedy School of Government. I was in Pakistan last summer conducting research for a thesis that looked at civil society actors and their relationship with the past two governmental regimes. And across the board, from government officials, leading NGO directors, and the public at large, there was a great deal of concern regarding the feudalistic elements remaining in Pakistan that governed, essentially, the political and landed elites and that were major obstacles to any health, education, and women's reform. What steps, if any, has, have you and your administration taken to address this? And if so, does it include any land distribution to move towards a more equitable democracy? Yes, I agree with you that we have a, we have a feudal structure in Pakistan. Uh, there's no doubt. But with passage of time, this feudal structure is diminishing in itself, within itself. There have been land reforms in Pakistan in the past, not very clearly executed. Uh, uh, but having said that, a social change needs to be brought about in Pakistan. And a social change will come through education, will come through poverty alleviation. And that is exactly what we are doing. As far as my government is concerned, I feel th three years is not really enough to bring about a social change. But uh, with the political restructuring that we've done, and in this political restructuring, when we have brought in the degree of education, the graduation condition into play, we feel that this hits at the feudalism in the, in the governance to quite an extent. So this is going to redress some ill of feudalism in Pakistan. And we are also, at the same time, when we have introduced the local government system, which was never there, and we have empowered the people, and in this, at the basic level, at the union council level, let me tell you that four representatives are from the, uh, from the workers and uh, farmers of Pakistan, four seats reserved for them. So we are doing all possible political restructuring to allow the common man to enter into the decision-making mold or in the, con in the in the politics of Pakistan. So through this empowerment of the people of Pakistan, through empowerment of the women of Pakistan, gradual social change will come about, we hope. But this takes time. I mean, you can't bring about social changes uh, in a short while. Lot has, been, lot has happened already in Pakistan, and I'm sure with passage of time, with correct policies, feudalism will keep going down, and uh, we, the situation will keep improving, hopefully. 
Assalamu alaikum. My name is Masood Razak. I'm a uh, student at the Harvard Business School and an alumnus of the college and an alumnus of Professor Nye's uh, course, which I took 10 years ago, Historical Studies 812. It was a great course. Uh, <laughs> sir, uh, welcome to Harvard on behalf of the Pakistani students and scholars that are here. Unfortunately, we haven't had an opportunity to interact with you and your delegation informally. Maybe that can come about somehow. But my question is maybe a bit more uh, a gentler question given the tough crowd today. Uh, given that you know there are a lot of educated young Pakistanis around the world today and some of us here in the audience and given the enormity of the challenges which you outlined uh, which face our country and the, and the number of reforms we need to do in every sphere of life um, how can young Pakistanis who are educated and maybe have spent their life or their working life abroad so far help uh, in building this Pakistan which you envision and contributing to the progress of our country what concretely can we do what avenues can we pursue to help in this uh, huge task ahead? Thank you. Thank you very much I mean, for your motivation, first of all. And uh, I uh, always have been saying in Pakistan in all my speeches that our generation has failed Pakistan, actually. That's true. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I'll hasten to add, I'm not failing them. <laughs> okay. But uh, let me say it's the, it's the younger generation, uh, people like you, who need to correct the situation, I hope. And uh, the future lies uh, in the younger generation. And we have a better younger generation. Uh, even in the politics of Pakistan, in the decision-making level, uh, when we are talking, when I'm seeing the people who are trying to come up in politics, there's a gradual shift. Uh, there's a gradual shift where the feudals, as uh, was asked just now, it is the sons uh, of the feudals who are coming up, uh, in many cases, not everywhere. But when we saw the sons, they have been educated outside. So while some people are saying it's the same faces, it's their own family, no, these are very enlightened, broad-minded future generation which is coming up. They are a much better lot, and we hope they are a better lot. Now. What you can do exactly, uh, really, I haven't thought of what you can do. You need to contribute to your country. You need to come back to your country. <laughs> First of all, are you prepared to come back? I'm working on it, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you better come back to Pakistan. And you everyone needs to contribute in whatever expertise you have. That is what I would like to say. I mean, there's no fixed agenda, okay, you get together or do something. You need to contribute your best in whatever potential you have, and you seem to be having a lot of potential, so come back to Pakistan. Thank you. I'm sure we could uh, uh, continue all evening. There are many people lined up who would like to ask questions. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, I want to uh, say that we're all very grateful to uh, President Basharaf for his frankness in answering questions. And I also, before we I ask you to join us in thanking him, want to thank the members of the Kennedy School staff, the IOP, the External Affairs Office facilities, and particularly the Harvard University Police for the extraordinarily good job they've done in providing security and making the arrangements tonight. And above all, uh, thank uh, Bill White, the head of the forum, and Joan Goodman Wilson, Williamson, who have done the hard work of making this all come about so uh, almost easily. Uh, but most of all, I want to thank President Musharraf for taking the time to join with us tonight to give us a full view of Pakistan in its many dimensions and to answer our questions. And uh, please join me in thanking President Musharraf for being with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you indeed.